Father Sibley uh, didn't realize that, I don't know if this is on very well, <clears throat> Father Sibley didn't realize that our numbers tonight were bolstered by the uh, meeting of the Insomniacs support group, people who are here just to catch some sleep tonight, so. <laughs> All right, uh, okay, so there's the microphones, Ron. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the great blessings that you give us in this life, especially the way that you want to direct us and guide us, to help us to know your love for us and care for us, to help us to recognize that you are with us every step of the way during this life, that we need only turn to you, listen to you. We pray that you would give us the grace to always have the courage to follow you and your will for us. And we ask all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody, for coming back tonight. Let me pose real quick. And uh, so on your handout here, I put a couple of things at the top. The book that is the best on this topic uh, is by Father Timothy Gallagher. It's called Discernment of Spirits. Uh, Father Timothy Gallagher is pretty famous. And he has... uh, there's a YouTube channel, which you can watch all of his different videos where he talks about this topic. There's a Discerning Hearts app, which kind of gathers together a lot of material on prayer and discernment and, and things like that. It's a very good uh, app. And then there's an iTunes podcast and things like that. So I just put down all those resources for you to kind of get some more information or to continue to get some information about that. So I recommend uh, the Father Gallagher's book on Sermon of Spirits and really all of his books. So tonight we're moving on. We left off last night with St. Ignatius and the beginning of his conversion. And so tonight we're going to move on with um, what he developed for us in the rules for the discernment of spirits. And as I said here, uh, we've got these three things in bold. Be aware, understand, take action. Those are the three things that go into discernment of spirits. And we heard last night about St. Ignatius who it said his eyes were opened a little bit. And the experiences were already there for him. You know, he was going back and forth between the desire for this uh, worldly project and then back over to this project of being a saint. It's going back and forth. And then finally, his eyes were opened a little bit. He becomes aware of this, that these things are going on, that he's being tossed about. Uh, and, and now, uh, as he becomes aware of it, he's ready to start understanding what those things mean. And so an understanding, after we've become aware, we move from noticing to understanding the spiritual meaning of those interior movements we've noticed. And so he has that quote from his biography, or autobiography. He began to marvel at the difference and to reflect upon it, realizing from experience that some thought left him sad and others happy. Little by little, he came to recognize the difference between the spirits that agitated him one from the demon, the other from God. So gradually he be able, begins to understand, like, well, one of these ideas is coming to him from God, and one of them is coming from the enemy of our human nature, from, from the devil. So he recognizes, uh, you know, which voice is which. And then finally, the taking action, which is really simple. Accept what comes from God, reject what comes from the devil. And we're going we're gonna to come back to these and kind of go through these things uh, tonight as we do so. But I wanted to, to start with, uh, if you could kind of just join me and think about, like, what would it be like being a priest? You know, um, I was ordained a priest at the age of 27, made a pastor shortly after that, just two years after that, I was made a pastor, so I was 29. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, as you're a pastor, as you're a priest, people start coming to you with problems, and they'd like some counsel. They come to you for spiritual counsel. They come to you for spiritual direction. So they come and, you know, they lay out all of these problems. And like, I have all these problems with my spouse. I have my problems. It was like what I was talking about with the consultation thing the other day. Problems with my spouse and difficulties in raising my children. Uh, problems in my interior life. I, I feel very distant from God. On and on. People bring all of these different difficulties and situations. I always tell people, like, um, for priests, I don't think there's a real, real great temptation to, 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 towards marriage because of the fact that most of the people who come to see you, you know, people don't come to see you like, Hey, Father, I just want to check in and let you know that marriage is great. I, I really love my wife, and my wife loves me, and it's just wonderful. You know, all we ever hear is like the bad things, like the trials and difficulties and things. So, uh, you know, people come with these problems, and here you are, 27, 28, 29 years old. 
uh, with very little experience outside of, you know, studying philosophy and theology and things, and you're like, what answers can I give to people? I mean, what, what can I really say to people that might help the situation in some way? And I think in most of my early years as a priest, it was sort of like, well, I'll pray for you. Uh, you know, that sounds really hard. <laughs> Try harder, you know. Uh, and not a whole lot else that I really had to offer in things. Uh, and so what I discovered later on and through a longer process with the rules for the discernment of spirits and the Ignatius of, of Loyola and things was that really ultimately what the priest should be asking and what people are looking for is, as I talked about in my homily this weekend, what is God saying? Like, and so that's the question. Anybody comes to me with any problem at all, it's what is God saying? That's the only answer I have for you is, is a question. What do you think God is saying to you in this? What do you think God's message is? And I'm telling you that, that that's what I say, because I think that's what, you know, you're not going to be able to have spiritual direction all the time, and you're not always going to have a priest that you can bounce things off of, but you're going to have you know, friends that you want to talk to and, and kind of thinking through the own, your own issues in life is to think, what is God saying? What is God saying to me? And if we can discover that, I think we're going to be able to find a pathway to move forward uh, through just about any, any situation. So I want to start tonight with some stories, and I actually have lots of stories tonight. Again, all of them are true, and none of them are exaggerated. Um, so let's start with a, a kind of an easy story. So I have this man I know in my parish. Uh, seems like a really nice guy. He's uh, older, you know, he kind of works sort of part-time, and I assume he's, you know, going to be retiring pretty soon. And he comes to see me. He comes to Mass with his wife normally. He comes to see me one week, and... Uh, it's really funny about being a priest. After a while, you discover that although everybody looks normal, healthy, and happy, everybody's got trouble. You know, everybody has difficulties. There's problems in, in everybody's life. And so this man, who everything looks normal, he comes to see me to tell me this, these problems. Uh, his wife is bipolar, and uh, when she gets manic, she gets the credit cards that come in the mail and takes them to the local casino and uh, loses thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So that he didn't even, he's got credit card debt on credit cards he never even knew that he had. Um, to the point where he now has to mortgage his house, he's not gonna be able to retire, his wife refuses to see a doctor, uh, he's not gonna get a divorce because you know, he, he, he's gonna stick this out and make this work in some fashion, but she won't see a doctor. And uh, now he's you know, gonna have to keep working till, he, till whenever, you know. Um, and he lays all these problems out in front of you, and you're like, I don't even know where to start. You know, I mean, I don't even know where we might begin at finding some, some answer as to how we're going to get through this. So I ask him the question I ask everybody. Well, I'm sure you've been praying about this. What does it seem like God has been saying to you? And his answer is nothing. You know, I pray and pray and pray and ask God, and nothing, nothing happens. He doesn't say anything to me. I keep praying for him to fix my wife, to make her, you know, get on some medication or see a doctor at least or do something, and she won't do anything. Okay. Um, so here's my next question. Have you ever had an experience where you thought God sort of talked to you? Like, has God ever said anything to you? Uh, has, yeah, has God ever said anything to you? And sometimes people will say, like, oh, kind of coincidence things, or, oh, you know, when my child was born, et cetera. And there's some truth to that, but it's not quite what I'm talking about. So I said, have you ever had an experience where God talked to you? And he's like, Whoosh. yeah. He said, you know, about a month ago, I was just worrying and worrying and worrying about this whole situation, and what I was going to do about it. I didn't know what to do. And I came into the back of the church, and we were having exposition and uh, he said, I knelt down in the back of the church, and there were a few other people up in the front of the church, and there were a bunch of candles burning. And he said, I was just kneeling there praying and worrying and worrying and worrying. And all of a sudden, I just heard this voice, sort of interior voice, from the altar, from the Eucharist, that just said, you are my friend. And he said, it was the most amazing thing. He said, I, I, never, even, I never wanted to leave the church again. It was so powerful. It was just like Jesus said, you are my friend. It was so clear. Uh, he said, you know, I, again, I never wanted to leave the church. So what's really funny or what's noticeable about this is you've been praying about it. Has God, you know, helped you or said anything to you? No. Okay, but a month ago he did tell you in a very sort of uh, mystical experience that you are his friend. Remember that? But we have this tendency in our life to be like, 
okay, God, that's great. What's next? You know, and uh, thank you very much. That's very kind. I, I'm happy about this. Let's move on to what's next. Now fix my problems. So I said to him, well, do you notice how maybe God did say something to you? He told you you were his friend, and that was kind of nice. And, and he said, to go along with this, you know, I just had this sense of hope, the sense of peace, the sense of like, I mean, this is just the greatest thing ever. So the point is here that we ask the question, what is God saying? And it doesn't fix all of his problems. Remember, I sort of almost listed 10 different things which were his problems. It doesn't really fix any of his problems, frankly. He's still got all the different things he has to deal with. But he has the most important thing, and that is that at the center of it, God is saying something to you, which is God, you're his friend. And so as a friend of Jesus Christ, all of those problems which seem so important they can get kind of pushed to the side because the most important thing is what is God saying to you? And you're going to be able to deal with your wife and the creditors and et cetera, et cetera. You're going to be able to deal that, deal with that from a position of hope and peace because you know you are a friend of God, but you want to hold on to that. So one thing there just to notice, like a lot of times God says something to us and we sort of forget about it rather quickly. And that's kind of a sad thing. Okay, a second example. And now this is going to be, I'm going to give you the very, very, very short version of this one. Uh, this woman came to see me one time, and she talked for 45 minutes about her problems. And none of them were exaggerated. She, uh, everything was a complete disaster and a mess. What had happened was she and her husband, at a young age, had made a commitment to just not having children, and that she would work on her career. She'd make a lot of money uh, as a professional. And then they'd be able to retire at a young age and have the freedom to do whatever they wanted to do. So that's a bad idea, right? Uh, and it did. It all collapsed. So uh, what happened was, yeah, they'd been very successful at that. They'd retired at the age of 55 or something. And then all of a sudden, something really weird happened. Her husband started to get involved in this relationship, which was very strange. It wasn't exactly like having an affair, but it was like having a daughter in another family. It was, it was sort of an outgrowth of this poor decision they had made. It was like having a, a, an extramarital daughter, basically, you could say. So now all of a sudden, her husband's doing all this crazy stuff uh, and, and, and walked away from the marriage, basically. She's moved clear across the country to Bremerton, Washington, and uh, she doesn't know what to do. You know, how is she going to, you know, her whole life, everything she's worked for has just collapsed around her. It's gone. And so she's just in a state of despair and unhappiness. So I'm like, all right, so what do you think God is saying to you in this? She's like, nothing. I pray and pray and pray. I pray to fix my husband. I pray to straighten out this situation. I pray to make sense of this whole thing, and there's nothing there. Okay. Um, but she's been going to daily mass. So I said, well, it's been nice having you at daily mass. I hadn't had a chance to talk to her for about the three weeks that she'd been there. And she kind of lights up, and she says, oh, yeah, I love going to daily mass here. I, the, the, the first time I, I was driving by this church and I saw it and I thought I'd stop in and our church is always unlocked. She said, I thought I'd stop in and I walked in the doors and I just immediately felt at home because it reminded me of the church where I had originally joined the Catholic church, you know, 20 years before or something. So she said, I just felt at home. Okay. We're going to come back to this later on, but this is very important. It's like, all right, now we've at least found a thread where we might be able to start a process, a conversation, because we've found some way in which God has given some consolation, some sense of hope, and we're going to see this in the rules, uh, some sense of hope, some sense of peace, some sense of being at home, an open door, basically, that we can walk through. And to make a very, very, very long story short, we went from there into, well, why don't you just come spend, if you feel at home in the church, why don't you come spend some time in the church and do some meditations? I'll give you some meditations. So we went through some of those, and as time went on, you could, I could just, this was the great thing about, this is the great thing about being a priest. As time went on, I got to watch as the Lord just went through and piece by piece fixed every one of these situations that she had made a disaster of, she and her husband. And it concluded with, and again, I'm not exaggerating, concluded with she, you guys have a beautiful statue of Our Lady, uh, with her just realizing, I need to just completely entrust my husband to Our Lady. This is about a month, two months after we had our original conversation. I need to just entrust my husband to Our Lady. She does that. She goes home, gets a text from her husband. Sorry, I've made a complete disaster of our lives. I don't know what I've been thinking, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the whole thing's put together. And all of it comes from just one little open door where we pick up the thread of God who gives some consolation and hope, God who speaks to us. And as we realize that, 
We've got an open door, and we start walking piece by uh, door by door, you know, step by step through this through this whole thing. And we're going to see. I'm going to. I'm telling you these stories because we're going to use them as examples as we go through the rules. The third story is is much uh, more recently. And again, this is the great thing about being a priest is you're seeing these things working. This couple that I'd met, uh, I, she told me that. They seem like a nice young couple, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden she said, oh, we're getting a divorce. And my, my heart just dropped in my shoes when she told me that. They were a Catholic couple, and uh, I didn't really have a whole lot to do with them or know them. I, I just saw them kind of uh, rarely or occasionally. And then, uh, uh, so what happened was this couple, they'd been married in the church, but their practice of the faith had been very, very, very sporadic. Just going to church every once in a while, uh, focused on lots of other things in their life, not going to confession. You know, both of them hadn't been to confession in probably over 10 years or so. Uh, had some children and things, but uh, certainly made some selfish choices around that as well. And, um, and so there'd been kind of this, you know, gr difficulties growing within the context of marriage, uh, struggles there. And uh, until finally it blew up into this separation, tending towards a, a divorce. So that's all I knew. And then the next thing I know, I see the husband who, uh, you know, it's obvious he's been crying at things and he goes to confession and gets that kind of straightened out. And then uh, he tells me the story of later on kind of what had happened after he'd gone to confession. Oh, so after he goes to confession, again, he goes to confession, walks out of the confessional, and his wife texts him and says, hey, we've made a complete mess out of this. We need to get things back on track. It was just like another miracle, basically, like, wow, God's at work here. So he tells me the story later on of what had happened, and, and what it was was um, his daughter had made her first confession, and he realized, you know, like, oh, this is beautiful. You know, she's gone to confession. She's so happy. She's so joyful. She loves it. Um, he started to think, like, you know, it's time probably for me to go back to confession and clear out all this garbage that's in my life and my wife. I can lead her to confession as well, and we could clear this all out and straighten it out. And then they didn't. They just didn't go to confession. And, and so it continued to build up until there was this blow up. So finally, after everything blew up, he wakes up one morning and he realizes, I need to go to confession. You know, like, I've made, I've been distant from God and away from God for the last, you know, 10 plus years. And, and he's, you know, he's crying and, and he realizes, I've got to go to confession. And he's so excited about going to confession, he gets in the car and he says, as I'm driving, there's something in my head that's saying, you can't just go to confession. You know, it's ridiculous that you're going to show up and go to confession. Uh, you're going to be too embarrassed to do it. Uh, it's probably going to be a long line. It's, all these things are saying, just forget it and go home. And he said, Father, you wouldn't believe it or you're going to laugh at me, but I just had this sense that all I had to do was push down on the gas pedal. It was really funny. He said, I just had this sense like all I had to do was push down on the gas pedal and everything was going to be fine. So he goes, he makes his confession, comes out, he's all, you know, straightens things out with his wife. Very, very, very beautiful uh, situation as that all kind of came together and things. And we're going to come back to his story a little bit too as, as we go on because as, I think it's a very beautiful example of how, you know, God is at work, but we need to be listening for God and we need to be aware of the devil so we make sure we're listening to the right one and not uh, being uh, tempted by what the devil has to say to us. So... Um, all right, so let's go through our, our rules then as, as we get to go. All right, number one, St. Ignatius is going to say here, in rules for the discernment of spirits, and this is the kind of preamble, rules for understanding to some extent the different movements produced in the soul and are recognizing those that are good to admit them and those that are bad to reject them. These rules are more suited to the first week. Don't worry about that. We won't deal with that now. But just notice this. He says... Uh, recognizing those that are good to admit them, those that are bad to reject them. So Ignatius just says, I just want to show you, here's what God sounds like, admit, receive what he has to say. Here's what the devil sounds like, reject. And so that's all we're going to do tonight is go through, what does God sound like, what does the devil sound like? I use this example, it's a silly example, but again, it's true. This woman said to me one time, she said, well, I'd like to go to daily mass more often, but, but I ask him, and, uh, and sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. And uh, so I thought she was talking about her husband, but then after a while I realized, she's talking about God. <laughs> so I said, what do you mean? I said, she said, well, I just ask God if I can go. And, and then sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. And I said, well, how do you know it's God who answers? <laughs> and she said, 
well, I don't know. I just, what if it's the devil who's telling you not to go to daily mass? And she's like, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> so I think there's kind of a better way. I don't know. We all do this like, all right, God, what should I do? Yes, turn right, go through. You know, we all kind of do that just being funny. But I think there's a better way of understanding what does God's voice sound like and, uh, and, and how do we hear God and recognize him? All right. So, in the case of those who go, okay, now our first rule is going to be a very particular and then we're going to leave it behind, okay? In the case of those who go from one mortal sin to another, the enemy is ordinarily accustomed to propose apparent pleasures. He fills their imagination with sensual delights and gratifications, the more readily to keep them in their vices and increase the number of their sins. With such persons, the good spirit uses a method which is the reverse of the above, making use of the light of reason. He will rouse the sting of conscience and fill them with remorse. So just think about this. If this is God and God's over here, and this is sin and, and, and the devil and he's over here, what happens is Ignatius says, people who are going from mortal sin to mortal sin, who are moving away from God, people who are comp- I'd say comfortable with sin, people who are complacent with sin, people who refuse to take the practical steps necessary to avoid sin. He says, the devil just says, hey, you're doing fine. Just keep going. You're on the right track. Don't worry about it. I know you think about going to confession, but you know what? Everybody does this stuff, so don't even worry about it. Okay? So the devil just says, you know, keep coming. You're you're doing fine. In this case, and in this case only, the Holy Spirit, the good spirit, uses a method which is the reverse, making use of the light of reason, he will rouse the sting of conscience and fill them with remorse. So in this case, and not in any others, the Holy Spirit is going to be bothering us, annoying us, trying to get to our conscience. That's the part where when we're in sin and and we wake up in the middle of the night and think, what am I doing? Why am I living this way? Why don't I, why don't I turn around? Why don't I go to confession? Why don't I do the things I need to do to avoid sin? So that's all there really is to say about that. I, I think it's pretty simple. I, maybe, I'm sorry, we could say more, but it's all we need to say about it for tonight. Except for I just want to point out this one thing. And that is that a lot of times people will feel like, you know, I had this whole time in my life where I was away from God, where I had just abandoned God and God abandoned me. And we were sort of miserable and unhappy, like that man in his marriage. You know, we were kind of just miserable and unhappy and there were difficulties. And, and I always knew, like, I need to be leading my family back to church and the practice of the faith and we need to be praying you know these are all the things he was telling me god had not abandoned them in any way it was god very much at work in their life with the sting of conscience with trying to get him to reason and to think you know what i've created you for more so even in that feeling bad even in the 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 remorse and the, the guilt and things That's a sign that God is at work in your life. Very, very important. What is God saying? Even in the case of a person who's moving towards mortal sin, God is still saying something to them. It's turn around or knock it off or the famous Bob Newhart thing, stop it. Um, But uh, he's trying to turn us around. So let's, that's simple. We'll move on from that. Number two, the second rule. In the case of those who go on earnestly, striving okay hold on let me go back to in the case of those who go from one mortal sin to another i i'd say basically this all of you who are here who are striving in some fashion to follow god you don't fall into the first category even if you sin on a regular basis the fact that you're trying right the fact that you're putting effort into your spiritual life moves you out of this first group of people okay so for most hopefully all of you we're talking about now you're moved into the second rule okay all right in the case of those who go on earnestly striving to cleanse their souls from sin and who seek to rise in the service of god our lord to greater perfection the method pursued in, is the opposite of the that mentioned in the first rule so this makes sense when we we're heading to sin god has to work in one way the devil works in another now as we move towards god The roles are reversed, Ignatius says. Then it is characteristic of the evil spirit to harass with anxiety, to afflict with sadness, to raise obstacles backed by fallacious reasonings that disturb the soul. Thus, he seeks to prevent the soul from advancing. So we kind of saw that in the story of the man as he's driving to go to confession on a Saturday morning. Oh, 
I was trying to think of what I was going to tell you. So what was really funny is the guy, he didn't know that there was mass before confessions. He just thought there were confessions. So he shows up early to make himself, get himself ready for a confession. And he shows up at a daily mass uh, on a Saturday during Lent. And he shows up right before the gospel. So what do you think the gospel is? Take a guess. Prodigal son, right? And he's like, so, yeah. So again, and we're going to see this right here in a second. So he's driving and he's trying to get there for confession. And the devil's like, oh, you can't do this. You don't want to do this. Uh, it's going to be embarrassing going to confession. You know, you've tried before to practice the faith and you guys always fall away. You say, oh, we're going to make it a priority and you never do. So he's hearing all of this in his head from it. You know, it's coming from himself and from the devil. And then he says, St. Ignatius says, it is characteristic of the good spirit, however, to give courage and strength, consolations, tears, inspirations, and peace. This he does by making all easy, by removing all obstacles, so that the soul goes forward in doing good. Now, when he, I was talking to him, and it was so funny, he said, Father, you're going to think this is goofy, but it was like, I just had this sense that all I had to do was push the gas pedal. And I was thinking of exactly this, you know, the Holy Spirit removing all the obstacles, trying to make it as easy as possible to go forward in doing good. And so now Ignatius kind of sets the stage here. We're going to go a little deeper into both of these things, but we got the stage set. We just want to uh, make sure we understand this. He says, when we start moving towards God, now God is going to try to make it as easy as possible. He's going to try to remove whatever obstacles that he can. Um, he's going to give us these uh, consolations in the forms of courage and strength, even tears, as we saw in the case of this one man. Uh, inspirations, it's time to go to confession. Um, peace, and this he does by making it easy. And then he says, here's what the devil's doing now. The devil is biting at us from behind. Okay, so now the devil's not in front of us, he's behind us. So he's kind of tearing at us from behind. It is characteristic of the evil spirit to harass with anxiety, to afflict with sadness, to raise obstacles backed by false reasonings, we could say, okay, false reasonings that disturb the soul. You know, you've never been able to do it before. Why do you think you're going to be able to do it this time? Thus, he seeks to prevent the soul from advancing. Okay, so very clearly, Ignatius here kind of sets the scene. He says, this is what, and it's just this, this is what God sounds like. This is what the devil sounds like. It's very important. This is what God sounds like. This is what the devil sounds like. You know, another thing, I always, um, when I do spiritual direction, I'll ask people like, okay, so what does it seem like God has been saying? And they say, well, I need to trust more. Okay, when did God say that to you? Well, I just always keep thinking I need to trust more. Okay, so you're just, you're just thinking that. That doesn't mean that that's what God is saying to you. And there may be parts in the Bible where God says you should trust me more. But that doesn't mean that what God is saying to you. That just means that you think that. And in fact, it probably causes you disturbance in your soul and you know, false reasonings and those sorts of things. A lot of times I, I think people can be just sort of cliche about, oh yeah, God is saying I need more faith. Well... I mean, did God really say that to you? Because if he did, here's what it would sound like. It would sound like courage and strength, consolation, tears, inspirations, and peace. Even when God tells us that we're doing something wrong, he tells us in such a fashion that we can say, oh yeah, that's exactly what I needed to hear. You know, oh yeah, that's exactly what the right thing is. Even when he convicts us of sin, uh, he tells us in such a way that there's, it's kind of surrounded in consolation and peace. So I guess I'm just saying, don't be so cavalier about well, what is God saying? Let's think really seriously about, does it sound like God? Does it have God's voice, basically? Okay? Now, in our third and fourth rule, Ignatius is just going to deepen for us what he's already explained. Okay? And so he's going to go a little bit deeper about... Uh, what this is going, what God is going to sound like and what the devil is going to sound like. The third rule of spiritual consolation. I call it consolation when some interior movement in the soul is caused through which the soul comes to be inflamed with love of its creator and Lord and when it can, in consequence, love no created thing on the face of the earth in itself, but in the creator of them all, 
Likewise, when it sheds tears that move to love of its Lord, whether out of sorrow for one's sins or for the passion of Christ our Lord or because of other things directly connected with his service and praise. Finally, I call consolation every increase of hope, faith, and charity and all interior joy which calls and attracts to heavenly things and to the salvation of one's soul, quieting it and giving it peace in its creator and Lord. We'll go back and go through this a little bit, but I mean, don't we just notice that there are some times in life where we just feel very close to God, right? There are times where we feel a certain spiritual energy, we feel a certain joy about going to Mass, where we feel a real draw towards prayer, where we enjoy praying, right? I mean, I think most of us would say, oh yeah, there's been times in my life where I've experienced that. Uh, times where we feel a real sense of peace about life and about our relationship with God. He says in here, this one, it says, um, uh, when the soul comes to be inflamed with love of its creator and Lord, and when it can in consequence love no created thing on the face of the earth in itself, but in the creator of them all. When we start to, he's saying there, when we start to just love our neighbor, our spouse, our kids, uh, because we love God so much, right? And we, lo- we, we love God in them, basically. And then he says, when even tears, okay, and so we saw that in the example of that man waking up with tears out of sorrow for his sins, and not kind of the the shame uh, tears that the devil would want from us, but instead a real sorrow for our sins, to be moved, you know, to tears through a reflection on the passion of Christ our Lord, or other things directly connected with, you know, the service of God and praise. And then he says, finally, I call consolation every increase of hope, faith, and charity, and all interior joy which calls and attracts to heavenly things and to the salvation of one's soul, quieting it and giving it peace in its creator and Lord. And so Ignatius is saying, this is what God sounds like. And so we look for, when we hear that, we recognize that voice of God, and we say, that's, that's the door I'm going to go through. And we're trying to say, what, you know, what has God been saying to me? It's going to sound like these things, an increase in faith, hope, and charity, uh, a sense of interior joy, you know, drawn towards heavenly things. And then we pass through that door, and it puts us on the right track. Now, let me give you another example. Uh, this was a woman that I'd worked with for a long time in spiritual direction, and we talked about lots of different things, but one of the things that she always struggled with was... Uh, uh, a certain addiction, a low-level addiction to uh, prescription painkillers. And so she had hurt her back at one point, and every once in a while she'd go back and tell the doctor her back hurt, and then she'd take some of these pills long after she had no use for them. And uh, her husband was actually a medical professional as well. And uh, so I would talk to her, and, and I'd tell her, like, all right, so you need to stop doing this. Yep, I need to stop doing this. Okay, so you're going to stop doing this. Yep. And then, obviously, she keep doing it. It's an addiction. And then I'd say, you know, I bet you the only way you could stop doing this is if you were to talk to your husband, who's a medical professional, and he could help you with that. And she'd say, yep, there's no way I will ever talk to my husband about this issue. He would be so disappointed in me and so ashamed of me. I could never, ever talk to my husband. And I'd say, well, I think you probably have to talk to your husband. And she'd say, like, well, I'm never going to do that. So then this goes on for months and months. Every once in a while, I'd come up and, and I'd tell her, you need to do this. And she'd say, well, I'm never going to do that. And then she came back and she said, well, I wrote a letter to my husband and I, and I uh, explained the whole situation. We talked about it and we, you know, we figured out a path forward. And I said, well, how'd that happen? And she said, well, um, I was, we have the, it doesn't matter, but she was riding the ferry. So we have the ferries from Seattle to Bremerton. Now, Father Sibley would say there's lots of ferries in Washington State, but these are the boats that you ride on. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so are you listening, Father Sibley? Yes, thank you. Uh, so the, uh, she was riding the ferry, and uh, she says, uh, she was praying the rosary, and she just had this sense, and Our Lady said to her, hey, you know what, you need to write a letter to your husband and explain this to him, and he'll help you figure it out. She's like, yep, I'm going to write a letter to my husband, and, help, and we'll figure it out. It's very important there, I think, in that story, you kind of see like the fact that, yeah, I can know what the right thing is to do, but I'm not going to do it. And I can tell you the right thing to do, but you're not going to do it. Um, But when God tells us to do something, 
he doesn't tell us like, he doesn't say like, oh, you're such a bad person. I can't believe you're supposed to be a mom and you're supposed to be a good person and you pretend to be all of this and you need to do something about it. And you need to tell your husband. That's just not really how God talks to us. Instead, you can kind of see it this way. God takes this truth, this very important truth, and he surrounds it in consolation, almost like the medicine and the sugar, basically. He surrounds it in such consolation that one experiences deep down, you know, a sense of peace, a sense of hope, a sense of joy, a sense of faith, you know, that God's going to take care of this, that it's all going to work itself out, uh, quieting it. And, and that truth, which may be very, very difficult, and, and in this case, it was like unimaginable. She said, no, I'll never do that. That, uh, when God tells us, we're going to be like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I need to do. And I think that's, a, again, a very, very important under, understanding of why we need to be praying and asking God to give us the help to do the things that we need to do, because we're not going to do it based on willpower. Uh, we're not going to do it you know, based on just trying harder. You know, Instead, we need to ask God to give us the consolation and hope to be able to do it. We're going to deal with, believe me, we're going to deal with and talk about, you know, desolation and the reality of that and, and how we kind of fight our way through that. But, but for now, we'll kind of focus on this idea of consolation there. So, um, all right, so we'll move on to the part about desolation. The fourth rule of spiritual desolation. I call desolation all the contrary of the third rule, such as darkness of soul, disturbance in it, Movement to things low and earthly, the unquiet of different agitations and temptations, moving to want of confidence, without hope, without love, when one finds oneself all lazy, tepid, sad, and as if separated from his creator and Lord. Okay, so we're going to skip the next part. We're going to come back to it in just a minute. But basically he says... Okay, so this is what God sounds like. The devil sounds like the exact opposite. I call it a desolation, all the contrary. So he says, God sounds like this. The devil sounds the opposite. Darkness of soul, disturbance in it, movement to things low and earthly, the unquiet of different agitations and temptations, moving to want of confidence without hope, without love, when one finds oneself all lazy, tepid, sad, and is separated from his creator and Lord. So all of you probably, I hope, experienced at some point in your life real times of consolation and closeness to the Lord where, uh, you know, very, just very beautiful, just this warmth, uh, a great joy in prayer and all of that. So hopefully we've experienced that at some point. And, uh, but we've also experienced times of real desolation where the things, you know, there's just, there's a tepid, being sad, uh, just feeling very distant from God. You know, when you're in real consolation, uh, and you can hear this in St. Therese if you kind of read through it, when you're in real consolation, it's just unimaginable that there's atheists. You're like, you're just saying that so you can do what you want to do. There's no way. How could anybody not believe in God? God's like, he's just like right there. He's so close to us. He's so, you know, how could you not believe in God? And then when we're in desolation, God feels so far and so distant from us. Um, that it's very obvious how people don't believe in, in God. You know, the real struggle that people can have with faith, just feeling very sad, tepid, lazy about our spiritual life, all the different agitations, okay? So we would recognize, like, yeah, I've had times of real desolation as well. Now, the beautiful thing about Ignatius' teaching is here we've experienced consolations and desolations, consolations and desolations. And there is going to be in the spiritual life a natural alteration between consolation and desolation. That's just the reality. There's a natural alteration between consolation and desolation. But that doesn't mean we have to just feel like, okay, today I'm close to God and everything's great. Oh, tomorrow everything's bad. Oh, today everything's great, you know, and just kind of get pushed around all the time. Ignatius in the rules is going to give us a way I almost say, I think of it like there's this thing on the Oregon coast called the Devil's Punch Bowl. And it's, uh, it's the waves as they come into this sort of cove thing and there's, uh, they just get tossed all about and things. And uh, you would never want to get stuck in there because it just bounces you all back and forth. And I think sometimes people in their spiritual life are that way, just sort of getting bounced around back and forth. Well, the rules give us like a, a rock in the middle. We can be like, I don't care what the water's doing, pushing this way and that. I know where I am. I know where I stand in relationship to God, whether I feel close to him or I feel distant to him. Uh, I know know exactly what I'm supposed to do and that's what the rules for the discernment of spirits do 
So we have to ask this question then, or answer this question, why does a person find themselves in desolation? Two answers are easy, and the third one you can guess. The first two answers are, well, if you sin in a serious way, and kick God out of your life by free choices that you make, you're going to find yourself feeling separated from God, right? So when we sin, when we give in to serious sin in our life, we're going to find ourselves uh, in a place of desolation. And that's not a bad thing, right? Because that's what moves us back towards confession and getting things back on track. So sin will leave us in desolation. The second thing is just a failure to pray as we should, you know. When we don't put the time and energy and effort into prayer, we can't expect that God is going to continue to reward us with all of the things that go into consolation. If he did, he'd be like a bad parent who, uh, you know, rewards his children for bad behavior. So when we don't pray like we're supposed to, all of a sudden we're going to start feeling that distance from God, you know, and that we're not close to him anymore, okay? Okay. The third one is probably the one that you can kind of guess is that, well, sometimes God leaves us in desolation for the sake of sort of testing us, allowing us to be kind of on our own and to, to realize, do we serve him just because we're mercenaries, that we like feelings of peace and faith and hope and love, and uh, as long as you give me those, I'll show up in the chapel to pray and I'll try to live a virtuous life. Or in times of desolation, do we have the ability to persevere uh, and to be faithful and to keep up our resolutions of prayer, despite the fact that it's just hard and we really don't seem to get much out of it and it's a real trial, okay? So the three things, we can control sin by not doing it. We can control prayer by actually spending time at it. But the third one is through no fault of our own, not doing anything wrong. Sometimes God just allows the natural desolation uh, as a part of the spiritual life to try us, to make sure that we're not kind of just mercenaries about our spiritual life. Okay, so does that make sense? And it's a very important point on why we're in desolation. Now, we're not going to have a chance to go through all the rules, but if you continue to read the rest of the rules, Ignatius is going to tell you what you're supposed to do if you find yourself in desolation. And if you find yourself in desolation, insist more on prayer. You know, like the devil's telling you, like, oh, this is so miserable praying. It's so hard to make a holy hour. I think I'll just stay here for 45 minutes today. Well, stay for an hour and five minutes. Insist on much on more meditation where we're going to really consider now. Why is it that I would be in this position? What is it that makes me feel distant from God at this point? Why, why do I find myself in this position? Uh, and you know just the endurance and perseverance in prayer So he's going to give us some rules for how we deal with these situations and that's what the rest of the rules are We don't necessarily have time to get through all of them um, Let's see here why? Now, let me give you a story to go along with this. Oh, no, no, no. no. Let me read the next one. Okay, let's go back to our rule four, fourth rule, the second paragraph there. Because as cons... Now, this almost goes as a... If you were to put rules three and four together, this rule, this little bit here would be an addendum to both of them. Because as consolation is contrary to desolation, in the same way, the thoughts which come from consolation are contrary to the thoughts which come from desolation. Very, very important, ready? So when we're over here in, in consolation and we feel very close to God, what are the thoughts that sort of naturally flow from that? Like, oh, you know what? Uh, my wife could probably use a hand, you know, making dinner tonight and, and I don't need to sit around and read the paper. It's kind of a waste of time anyway. Maybe I can just help with that. There's just a generosity that flows from it, a desire to be more loving, a desire to be more forgiving. And so that now we're moving from here's how I feel interiorly about me and my relationship with God to here's how I relate to the world. You know, how are the actions that are going to be carried out now based on how I feel? So in consolation, when we feel close to God, when we love God, when we feel loved by God, isn't that a time where it's easy to be you know, generous? Isn't that a time where it's easy to be sacrificial? A time that it's easy to be forgiving? And so those thoughts now and the actions that flow from those thoughts are going to be one thing. Now if we move over here into desolation where we feel extremely distant from God. We feel like God has kind of abandoned us, that God's not listening to any of our prayers, that, you know, I don't even know why I believe in God in the first place. Um, you know, we forget about all the time that we've ever been in consolation and everything God has done for, for us in the past because we feel like, you know, we're in desolation now. We've always been in desolation. And we're always going to be in desolation. 
uh, what kind of thoughts and what kind of actions are going to flow from being in, you know, over here in this state? Well, we're not going to be generous. We're going to be like, I'm going to go home and I'm going to drink. Well, I'm in desolation, so I need some consolation. So I'm going to go home and I'm going to have uh, two glasses of wine for, co for my consolation and perhaps three if I really don't get consoled. Uh, and I'm going to watch uh, a season of something on Netflix, right? Or I'm going to watch... You know, I'm going to sit and watch, binge watch TV or something. I'm going, to make, I'm going to make consolation for myself because I'm not getting it from God. So in desolation, there's going to be certain thoughts that flow from that, which are, um, you know, are not going to be, you know, the actions that God wants. You know, okay, so Ignatius says, because as consolation is contrary to desolation in the same way, the thoughts which come from consolation are contrary to the thoughts which come from desolation. So from consolation, we said that's a gift that God gives us. Desolation is when the devil is the one who's speaking loudest, basically. So when we base our thoughts and actions on consolation, we're following the direction that God gives us in our life. When you base your thoughts and actions on being in desolation, who are you allowing to direct your life? I mean, you're just basically saying to the devil, like, hey, what do you think I should do today? You know, how should I make myself happy, okay? And I'll give you an example yeah, we're in good shape. Well, I'm going to give you an example, and we're going to be done in one hour. Um, so this is, again, a true story. This was a few years ago, probably five or six years ago, and um, I had one of these weekends just built up that was going to be one of the busiest weekends of, you know, it was just everything. It started on uh, Saturday morning with mass and confessions, and then some activity in the afternoon, and then confessions and mass, and then I had to go somewhere in the evening for something. And uh, the next day was going to be mass, and then baptisms, and then mass, and then go to the baptism party, and then something in the afternoon, and then uh, come back for the mass in the evening. And it was just like, whoa. I mean, it's nonstop action. And uh, so in the middle of it, oh, after the 5 o'clock mass on Saturday evening, this woman comes up to see me, and uh, she says, Father, would you go see my husband in the hospital? Now, I knew she was a very pious Catholic. She had uh, a necklace with about 37 uh, holy medals on it. So I knew she must be pious in some fashion, which is not always a good, uh, not always a good sign. And, uh, but I knew she wasn't one of my parishioners either. And I said, well, what parish are you from? So I don't have a hospital in my, in my parish. The hospital's in the neighboring parish. And I said, well, what parish are you from? And she said, well, I'm from such and such parish. And I said, well, why don't, maybe, why don't you ask your priest to go visit him? Because I just had too much stuff to do. And I said, why don't you go ask your priest? And she said, well, my husband really doesn't like our priest. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, so, uh, okay, fine, I will. But let me say this. And she said he, he had cancer and he was dying. Um, but he wasn't dying, you know, in the next couple of days or anything. So I said, well, but I have this, this, and this, and this, and this. And I can probably go see him tomorrow afternoon at some point. And she said, oh, that'd be fine. That'd be great. So then I uh, get through the evening's activities. And the next morning, so I remember this very, very clearly. The next morning at the first mass and during the baptism and the, and the confessions, or sorry, in the second mass, was just these, just being bombarded and attacked and uh, just hammered by these, uh, these ideas like, you know, I don't know why you ever became a priest. It was like the dumbest thing ever for you. This is such a waste of a life. Uh, I can't even believe you're doing it. I can't even believe the demands that people make. Nobody even appreciates everything you do. If they were to see your schedule and everything you have, and then they ask you, oh, can you come to the baptism? I mean, on and on and on, you know? <laughs> so all during Mass, if you wonder what priests think about at Mass sometimes, this is what I was thinking about all during Mass. I'm like... <laughs> Just like, just come on, let's just get focused. We'll get through the day, and at the end of the day, we'll be able to go home and have three glasses of wine. <laughs> and my, uh, my uh, consolation is uh, watching, so I go elk hunting, so my consolation is watching elk hunting videos on YouTube. Um, and uh, so I'm like, I'll just go, fine, I'll get through the day, put it in cruise control, check out, and uh, get home and have my wine and, or beer or whatever and, and watch YouTube videos. So, but just getting hammered. So, baptism, next mass. Now it's time to, oh, I've got to go to the hospital before I go to the baptism party. 
but I'm really just exhausted. Like, I'm really tired. And part of it was because of this sort of spiritual battle which had been going on all this morning. Although I didn't really even recognize it as a spiritual battle. I just was thinking, I, you know, maybe it was a bad idea to become a priest. And um, <laughs> so we're kind of going through the... So I get over to the hospital. And I remember this. It's in room 222. Every time I pass by that room, I think about what happened there. So I walk into the room. And this guy is uh, in his own room. There's nobody else there. And he's sitting there, and he looks up at me. And I said, oh, hi, so-and-so. Are you uh, so-and-so? Your, your wife asked me to come visit. And I'm just, like, exhausted. I don't, I've, I don't know that I'm often that tired. And uh, I said, your wife asked me to come visit. And he says, oh, jeez. She must have sent every priest in the county to come visit me. <laughs> and I was just going to be like, well, uh, go to hell, because i got better things to do. <laughs> And I would have said that, honestly, I would have said that, except I was so tired, and there was a chair there that I thought, well, I'm just going to sit down and talk to him because I'm so tired. <laughs> It'd be better than having to walk away, so I'll have a chance to sit down. So I sit down, and uh, he says, yeah, my wife keeps sending priests over to see me. You know, I just don't believe in all that stuff. Uh, it's been, uh, or I don't even believe in that stuff. I haven't been at church in 20 years. He said, but I watch the History Channel a lot, and, you know, all the stuff about the Knights Templar and, and all this stuff, and I said... You know, all that stuff's made up. It's not even true. It's just a very anti-Catholic channel. It's not even true anyway. And he says, yeah, well, I just, I don't have time for this. My wife's very pious and everything like that. And I'm so tired, I just, like, I open up my little uh, bag with my uh, kit for sick calls. And uh, I put on my stole. And he's like, well, I don't want to go to confession. I'm like, well, how long has it been since your last confession? Like, I'm going to trick him into going into confession, basically. <laughs> So he says, uh, I said, how long has it been since your last confession? And, he's like, and he just stopped, just absolutely stopped. And he wouldn't talk, and he wouldn't talk, and he wouldn't talk. And finally, like, tears start coming out of his eyes. And he says, it's been you know, 22 years. Blame the church, and I stopped going to Mass, and all this stuff. And just all of this garbage comes out, basically. And uh, he was dying of pancreatic cancer. And, uh, he, you know, he was ready to die in that state, basically. And uh, so he makes his good confession. And, uh, you know, he receives absolution and Holy Communion for the first time in 22 years. And, and I'm just kind of over, overwhelmed by this whole experience. Like, man, I can't believe how great it is to be a priest. You notice, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the morning it was like the devil was just hammering away at me. And I'm like, oh, this is such a terrible life. What a waste of time. And I'm just thinking, oh, it's so wonderful being a priest, you know, to get to see something like this. And uh, so anyway, it was, it was very, very beautiful. My point is, though, if I had spent my morning just saying, you know what, you're right, what a waste of time and what a waste of energy. This guy probably doesn't need anybody to come visit anyway. I'm just going to go home and take a nap. I'm going to allow my thoughts and my actions to flow from being in this state of desolation where you're getting hammered by the devil. You know, none of those things, well, God could have worked it out in some other way, but those things wouldn't have happened. That man wouldn't have been reconciled to the church. And, it was very beautiful. The next day, uh, he came to, uh, or that, that, sorry, that next Sunday, he was out of the hospital. Uh, he was dying of pancreatic cancer, so he only had maybe a month to live. And he came to the hospital and said, uh, or came to the church. And I saw him after Mass, and, and uh, he was just so, you know, it was just, he was so overwhelmed by gratitude. And he said, uh, he said, I will never, <laughs> sorry, he said, I will never miss Mass again. <laughs> That's what I thought. We only got four more weeks. How hard is it going to be? <laughs> So that's an absolutely true story. Not one, not one word of it is made up. It all actually happened. You only got four weeks. Come on. So, uh, so yeah, that was beautiful. But the point is there, if we allow our thoughts and our actions to flow from desolation, then we're going to miss out on the things that God wants, wants to do. Okay? So, uh, you know, we... Okay, so... We're going to talk more about this. So let's move into this idea of action fundamentally. And most simply, the activity is to accept what comes from God and to reject what comes from the devil. So if I had had a little keener sense or I'd been paying a little closer attention, I would have recognized, oh, these are desolations that are coming from the devil and I don't need to pay attention to them. 
And I would just feel like, go to hell, go to hell, go to hell. Just not pay attention. Not, I'm just going to reject. And I'm not even going to like negotiate with the devil. Like, oh, you know, maybe that's kind of right. Let me think about it. No, it just has to be absolute rejection of whatever comes in, in desolation. Uh, to accept means to receive. You know, just to receive. And we come back to this most important work. Receive, receive, receive what God wants to give. In consolation, God gives this gift of himself and his grace, and fundamentally, um, he wants to give us this gift of, of himself. And so we have to stay with this gift, and as I said, not just say thanks and move on to what's next, but really unpack it, enjoy it, and, and relish it. Um, let's see, we got five minutes or so. Let's, uh, okay, let me tell you one more story. This is a true story. Uh, sorry, I always say that. Uh, I knew this priest. I, was, I did spiritual direction with him. He was a very, very hardworking and overworked priest. And, and he always had this kind of workaholic attitude towards everything, which was very unhealthy. Uh, so he finally goes on this retreat. It's really funny. He describes this retreat. Uh, the retreat director is like, okay, so I want you to pray with these scriptures and, and do this. And so he, he prays with those scriptures that day. And then he comes back the next day and he's like, the priest is now telling the spiritual director, here's what I think I should do. And he lays out this whole plan of his retreat and how he thinks it should go. You know, just like an absolute control freak. Crazy, right? And uh, so he, finally the retreat director kind of calms him back down and gets him on the right path. And uh, he arrives at this point during the retreat where there's just this, God directs his attention in a very, very clear and very consoling way around the word stillness like stillness, like just be still. You know, that's a very common theme in the Old Testament. Just be still and let God do the work and let God do the fighting. So he's like, okay, got it, be still. So he's coming home from the retreat. It's funny, we can be so spiritually blind about our own situations. Uh, and you'll think this is funny what I'm about to tell you, but it's, again, it's true, we can be this bad. Uh, he's coming home, flying home from the retreat, and he sits down and he writes up this whole, so God has told him, just be still, okay, just be still. So he comes home, and uh, on the way home, he writes up this whole rule of life about everything he needs to do, starting with, I'm going to get up at 5 in the morning, I'm going to exercise, do this, I'm going to say this, I'm going to read this, I'm going to, on and on and on, right? And so he's telling me this, and I'm just like, are you... Let me just kind of hold this up to you. Can, you. can you see what you're doing here? You're telling me that God very clearly told you just to be still, and everything you're doing is the exact opposite of that. And he was saying, and I, this was part of his spiritual direction, was he was so disappointed in himself for not living up to all of the things that he had written down in his new uh, rule of life. Again, ask the question, what is God saying? And focus on that and stay on that. And don't just try to move on, but instead continue to rece re receive this idea. If it's stillness, stay with stillness. If it's, you are my friend, keep receiving that. You know, if it's uh, um, the example, oh, the woman who, you know, God says to her, just write the letter to your husband. Or the, Our Lady says, write the letter. You know, just receive that and follow that direction. Okay, so receiving is, is the most important part that goes into that. What the devil wants to do, even when he comes in with these ideas, which sound very good, like, why don't you write up a rule of life so that we can make sure we're still? What the devil wants to do is, is kind of lead us down this path that's going to get us off of God's track, okay? And it's going to end up with, I feel so bad because I'm not living up to my rule of life. So you kind of see the idea there. Um, let's conclude with our last rule, which is a simple rule in some ways, but a very, very important rule. Never, ever, ever, ever break it. Ready? The fifth rule. In the time of desolation, never make a change, but to be firm and constant in the resolutions and determination in which one was the day preceding such desolation, or in the determination in which he was in the preceding consolation. Because, as in consolation, it is rather the good spirit who guides and counsels us, so in desolation it is the bad, with, those, with whose counsels we cannot take a course to decide rightly. So the idea here is, he says, when we make a decision, and we're going to talk about decision making tomorrow, when we make a decision and we've prayed it through and we've discerned and we've recognized as God leads us in consolation, 
Now when we suddenly just have the natural alteration into desolation, don't think it's time to change. You know, don't think, oh, I, I made a mistake, I need to make some, some big change in my life, because you always get yourself off, off track. Because, as he says, in, the, in consolation, we're listening to the good spirit, in, in desolation, to the bad, all right? Now the reason I put that rule there without explaining it too, too much is because to get you kind of a starter, if you read through the rest of the rules, you will see what uh, St. Ignatius tells us to do in desolation. So he says, in one thing, don't make any big changes about major decisions. In other things, make some changes with prayer and change your, don't make any changes about, but make some changes within yourself. You know, prepare for times of desolation. So he gives all these rules, and I just want to point out, there's a, a, for, there's a path forward for the next um, there's rules 1 through 14. Uh, there's a path forward with rules 1 through 14 and uh, as a way to continue to understand, you know, what God is saying. So in the end, tomorrow we're going to talk about discerning God's will. Like, how do I figure out what God wants me to do? It's a nice night. It's going to build on what we talked about tonight with consolation and desolation. Um, and so hopefully you'll be able to come to that. But hopefully you see tonight... As I think as a priest, I'm asking this question, you know, what is God saying? Hopefully for yourself, you're always asking that question as well. Like, what is God saying? What's God saying to me? What is God saying to my friends? You know, helping people for them to understand. Let's focus and try to understand what is God saying. Because out of all the worries and anxieties, all the difficulties in life, yep, and there's lots and lots of them, um, the, one that sh the thing that should be central for us, the thing that should be most important is, but what is God saying to me? And as we listen to that, the Lord opens up for us a beautiful path forward. And so uh, let's pray and ask the intercession of Our Lady, who certainly was the one who listened most carefully to, to what God was saying to her in her life. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, so I'm going to be hearing confessions tonight back there. And uh, Father Sibley is going to be drinking wine and watching YouTube videos. <laughs>